All right, y'all. So we're going to get this party started. Uh, it's it's time. Let's get it on. All right. So we're going to start the night off with uh, Robert. And yes, this is a Q&A. So in about in just a few minutes, I'm going to let people uh, be able to drop their uh, questions into the chat, but not right now. So we're going to listen to, the, to our clinicians. Get your questions ready because they're ready to answer your questions. All right. Robert, uh, first question up out of the night. Um, how do you improve as a band director? Um, well, I think there are many ways that you can improve um, on, in your teaching or being a band director in general. Um, and I'm going to speak, uh, I'll share all of those with you guys, and then I'll share a couple things. I see that we have a lot of middle school um, band directors in the room, so I'll share uh, my thoughts on that as well. I think the best piece of advice I ever received from anyone was surround yourself by people who are smarter than you. And then it was like a comma and then sit there and don't talk. <laughs> and I said, okay. And they said, listen and absorb everything that you can learn from those individuals that you know that are smarter than you. One of the biggest things that I see that band directors, young and old, have um, the problem doing is asking questions. They're afraid to ask questions. And they're afraid to ask questions for a number of reasons, and especially with young teachers. And I deal with a lot of um, young teachers, you know, in mentorship roles, um, where they're just afraid to come across as someone who um, doesn't know a lot, or for lack of a better word, you know, stupid, you know, and it's like, we don't want you to feel that way. Um, the re how we got to where we are is by asking questions and by surrounding ourselves with those that were smarter than us who could help us on this journey that we call teaching band. Um, I encourage you to get out and observe as well. I see there is a lot of young, like one to five year teachers. Some students are still in college. Some people are still, um, or student teaching. You know, I encourage you to get out and observe in programs that you respect um, and observe in situations that you're going to teach in. If you know that you're gonna teach in a Title I situation or you know that you're gonna you know, be, be there, then go out and observe teachers that are doing great things in those situations and see what tools they're using and to be successful within their programs. Um, you know, I have always been an advocate of, of listening to great uh, recordings. I remember when I was a first year band director, I used to come home and cry because <laughs> uh, I would listen to what I was playing in the band hall and then come home and listen to the reference recording that I, that I loved and could not realize figure out why it, you know, it didn't sound the way, the same way. So, um, and I still remember every single day going back in the band hall going, nope, we're gonna make this sound exactly the same way. And then it's like, well, how do I achieve that? You know, and you just get better at teaching and get better at the skill, but listen to great recordings. And there are also wonderful podcasts that are out there that give great information about teaching, you know, whether it be a beginner skill or teaching the ensemble or just about teaching band in general. And I encourage you to be a part of those podcasts and, and listen to those great recordings. There's also great books out there as well, too. And I know, especially in college, a lot of times the college professors will encourage their students to read certain great literature that's out there. And I encourage everyone, um, there's so much out there about teaching band and about teaching instruments specifically and about teaching, um, you know, middle school specifically. And so I encourage you to wrap your head around those books and that knowledge and, and learn from those. Um, there, I am a firm believer in mentors and mentorship programs. You know, I think um, that so many people are afraid to have people come into their band hall. And my favorite phrase when someone calls me is, I don't want to have you come out until my band is ready. Well, your band is never going to be, quote, ready. So the only way you're going to get better is by allowing people to hear it. When I say standing naked in front of your peers, they come in and they hear your band and they give you tools and um, skills that you can use to continue to help make your bands better. And if you're anything like me, and I know these guys are the same, you know, we're always looking for ways to continue to improve our ensembles. And even when I'm standing on the stage at a major performance, I'm still worried about something that probably I didn't get to where I wanted it to be before, you know, we're about to give the downbeat for the concert. Um, there's some great mentorship programs through TMEA and TBA and, and uh, all of the fraternities. And so I encourage you to look into those as well. Um, and they offer great services and great people to come out and, and help your programs. Um, for those young teachers, you know, I encourage you to get involved in your regions as well. You know, I think one of the best things I ever did was before I was holding a region office, I would just go and spend my time um, when the clinician was there doing region band, sitting in the back of that rehearsal and listening and volunteering my time to set up the chairs and the stands, you know, and to go with them when they went to lunch to be a fly on the wall. So if there's ever those opportunities for you, we encourage you to, you know, jump on that as well. I think that's a really great uh, way to continue to grow and learn. 
Um, for my middle school people out there, and this could be for high school as well, you know, I remember the very first time I ever had to teach the flute class, I was scared to death and I did not know what I was going to do. So I got a flute and I came home and I started playing flute. And every time I would go back the next day and the kids would sound a certain way, and I didn't know how to fix it. I was very honest with them. And I told them, like, I don't know how to fix that. But when I come back tomorrow, I'm going to have three or four tricks in my bag so that we can try these things. And then I went home and I tried to recreate that sound on my instrument. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe, they're, maybe their teeth are too closed or whatever the case would be. And I would put all those in my bag of tools and take it back to school the next day. Um, and then, of course, I would call all my colleagues and friends and ask their questions, ask them questions and get their opinions on um, playing the instrument but the biggest thing you can do is learn to play the instrument it does and i started teaching and every summer i would learn a new instrument so i would even though in college and let's be real you're going to come out of college and you're not going to really know everything you need to know um, you think you are but the piece of paper is blank on the back when you turn it over just fyi so you're gonna get out there and you're gonna try to figure it out and I just took an instrument every summer and spent time on it. What does it feel like to be a trombone player, a beginner trombone player, and playing out of the beginner trombone book and learning all the beginner trombone skills? And so that was one of the best things that I ever did that really helped my personal pedagogy continue to grow so that I could be able to get out there and uh, make my students better. Um, that being said, it's really tough sometimes, and we all kind of can leave out of the band hall or leave out of your classroom and feel like you're not a good teacher, and you can beat yourself up about it. But again, the you know I want to remind you of the why. Remember your why. Why did you go into this? And that will fuel your fire to continue to get better. So I just encourage you, you know, the biggest thing I can tell you, though, is never be afraid to ask questions. And then when you see things like this, virtual band conferences or even your state conference, go to those and listen to individuals. I've been teaching for a long time and I still go to all of the clinics that are out there because I want to be a lifelong learner. And I, there is always something that someone says that I can pick up to make me a better teacher and make my students better. Amen. The church is now open for membership. We're ready to go. <laughs> plate coming around. Y'all put that money in it. <laughs> Pass the plate. <laughs> no. Uh, the, but those are some really great points. And now with some of that knowledge, like Lisa, with the knowledge you have, and you've been teaching, you have a lot of experience under your belt. If you were to go back 10 or 15 years, what advice would you give to yourself? Well, it's really funny because I could just take everything that Robert just said and just say it to you again, because he touched on everything that, that, that I, I mean, everything he just said is exactly what I would tell anybody who's whatever year you're in the teaching. If, if you don't do these things, you're not going to um, actually feel that level of success that you really want to. Um, I can tell you that as I, I was fortunate as a young teacher to be surrounded by incredible teachers. Greg Countryman, um, uh, Beth Adams, Jim Drew, um, uh, Joe Pruitt, um, Bill Duggan, David Lambert. I, and it just so happened that we would find ourselves at dinner just about every Friday night. And we spent mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds of time. I mean, lots of time talking about what we did that week. How did we do it? What worked? What didn't work? What, did, what new things did we discover? Who did we talk to this week that gave us new information? You utilizing the people that are around you and seeking out mentors that are lifelong friendships. I mean, I still call Greg Countryman. Hey, Greg, tell me how to do this. I'm working on this with these kids. I can't seem to get this to work. Tell me what to do. The day you decide that you don't have any questions to ask, that's probably the day you're going to probably need to go find yourself another profession. Um, I spend every day, I am searching for ways to be better. And so as a young teacher, just to go off of what Robert said, you need to ask questions. You, and you need to be diligent about asking questions and extremely reflective about what's going on, what's working, what's not working, what is my part in the classroom that's not creating the opportunity for these kids to learn. Because almost any time I leave the classroom and I don't feel like the lesson has gone well or the kids were cooperative or we didn't learn what we needed to learn, I always go back to figure out what is it that I needed to do different. Um, if you ever begin to believe it's all on the kids, 
that's another sign that you're probably not doing what you need to do. Um, they are absolutely participants in their learning, but I get to decide. I set the classroom um, uh, weather. It's partly cloudy, it's super sunny, or it's stormy, and um, it's in my hands. And so, um, as far as going back and looking all those years, that what I would continue to do, I would continue to seek out even more people than what I did early on in my career. Um, early on in my career, it was much like, um, I think Robert mentioned, you know, getting people to, to come and listen. You don't do it when you think everything's perfect. Um, I, I had the opportunity to go to West Texas um, State University at the time, it's West Texas A&M, and I was under Dr. Gary Garner and around some fabulous teachers. And I got a, a music business degree. Um, I went to the Houston Grand Opera, I went to Warner Brother Records, I went to Houston Grand Opera. I had a really interesting start. But I was married to Jim Drew, and um, Jim was teaching. And that's when I went, wow, this is really what I want to do. So I went to the University of Houston, and I started working uh, and, and learning under uh, Mr. Green. And, and let me tell you, the, it changed my life. Because I had such an incredible knowledge from WT, and I had such incredible knowledge from Mr. Green, and I, I decided that it was super important that I take everything from both camps and pull it together and be able to use it. And so um, I'm telling you, it, it completely changed my outlook. And so I began to have Mr. Green come out and work with my kids, and 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 his knowledge of of just being aware of your body and what you're doing and how you are doing it and everything, it was life changing. And then all the knowledge from my WT, the technical side, the, the, the ways to fix things, ensemble, just all, all of that was, was incredible. So if you're not seeking mentors, and I don't mean just one, if you're not seeking multiple mentors, um, I think you're doing yourself a disservice because it will absolutely change um, how you do things. And, and they, Look, it's, 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 it's an endless resource to be able to put yourself in check, but then also challenge yourself to keep learning. Because you said being a lifelong learner and um, the day I'm telling you, I'm constantly seeking information. I've been on here four nights. This is my fourth night um, and I'm teaching flute. I've taught flute other years, but man, I sat down and I wrote everything down that Helen Blackburn said last night because she's phenomenal. So biggest thing, you have to ask questions and you have to be a lifelong learner. You have to be willing to be reflective uh, with yourself and then don't beat yourself up, but, but focus on what is it I can do better and, and, and stay in, to me, in a state of observation. I am constantly observing and, and I have mental pictures of when something doesn't sound right, I, I visualize what's going wrong. Can I visualize what's going on inside the mouth? What's happening uh, with the embouchure? What's happening with the teeth? Uh, and because I spend so much time like that, I found that I, I'm able to solve a lot of problems that I, I really didn't ever have an answer to, but I figured it out because I spent so much time um, thinking about it. So stay in observation, reflection, and, and get your mentors and ask lots and lots of questions. Yeah, and guys, as they're talking, I just opened the chat for if you have questions, start dropping your questions and we'll start passing them on to the clinicians as, as we get to them, okay? Um, and clinicians, y'all can bounce off of each other as we move on here. Uh, Jarrett, uh, sometimes, you know, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, and it might feel like we're getting in a rut with ourselves or with our ensemble. How do we get out of a, a state of being stuck? Or how do, how do you get out of that? Um, it's a great question. I think um, probably the answer is going to be a little bit different for everybody based on the situation that they're in. I think for my situation, so you know, I, I've been at the same school for uh, this would this is year 12. And so I've been in the same place. Uh, and I started as an assistant and, and moved into the head role. And it was also a new school at the time that started with 140 kids. And um, but three years ago, we, we reached about 300 and we've been there. And so, you know, there's, there's been a, a big piece of the puzzle with Claudia that, you know, the school itself has, has had different circumstances and changes that have made it so that the ensemble is constantly developing. And, and some of that 
um, has has kept life interesting uh, just in the fact that there it feels like each year there's something that's a little bit different or maybe the group is different or we try to set it up a little bit differently or um, the band director Alan that I co-teach the wind ensemble with and, and do a lot of the marching band stuff with uh, Alan is in his 43rd year of teaching and so um, the fact that he's been doing it for 43 years and, and has spent 12 of them at Johnson and was was at Churchill uh, in our district for 11 uh, so you think you know more than half of his career he spent between two high schools and so we talk constantly about um, you know getting in a rut and, and are we doing the same things and um, you know even with with the excitement of feeling like the school has developed and, and has you know become more exciting um, you know we've constantly had to reevaluate ourselves. and so you know Alan and I we, we talk all the time about uh, you know the way the group sounds, listening to recordings or concerts or rehearsals, and our, and um, you know bouncing ideas off of one another. And I think you can tell you know if the kids are are feeling like they're in a rut, and you're in your rehearsals, and maybe they're not reacting to your jokes the same way, or they're not responding, or your warm ups feel like they're on autopilot. Um, you know you've got these simple things that you can try to do you know to try to brighten it up, maybe mix the routine up. You know I know there's a um, in, in middle school the consistency you know we talk a lot about the importance of the consistency of the daily routine but I also know a lot of middle school directors that figure out a way to keep it consistent without necessarily just doing the exact same thing in the exact same way every day so I think some of that comes down to the personality and the delivery um, you know in the high school environment you know maybe you do your long tones a certain way one day and you do your lip slurs a different way whether it's you know a Remington up one day or a Remington in different count structures or you know maybe it's a singing rehearsal and so you know about four or five years ago, we got into a routine where every day we did a different daily drill. And every day uh, we tried to divide up the way the ensemble, you know, setting them up in different ways, whether we rehearse them in, in choirs, like a, like an actual choir where we put our sopranos together, our altos together, tenors together, basses together, uh, setting them up in a circle in the room, setting them up where they have their backs to one another, uh, breaking apart into different groups. And, you know, it's a lot of stuff. Um, Gino, who I work with in the summer, he'll tease me all the time because he'll go, you know, you pretend that stuff works and you know and and you're really just trying to keep things interesting does it really make the band better and that's exactly the point and he'll laugh it is that you try to keep it interesting and one of the hardest parts about drum corps tour is is getting up every single day and doing the same thing over and over and over again but that's the way the activity is wired and so you know i think if you can figure out ways every day to have a different you know have your routine do things you know that you need to to make the group great but but you know what can you do to to kind of mix things up a little bit so that the kids don't get bored and you don't get bored and and i'm all about consistency but i still think there's a way to do both. Um, I think probably the, you know, we feel like all the time, you know, with the marching band uh, and, and with the concert bands, uh, that we're we're trying to find you know different role models of sounds that we like and uh, there are years where I feel like based on instrumentation you know we might be trying to go for a, a, a calmer sound that's a big term you know that I, I see we're pretty split in terms of locations you know Texas likes to talk about calm uh, and and I do like calm sounds if I'm in a calm mood but there are times that I don't want a calm sound I want to hear something that's loud or something that's exciting and so you know I think that's the part of where if you can have a variety of different um, different styles you know we play for the kids if, if we're going to do buckaroo holiday this year we might listen to san francisco new york berlin uh and and try to hear different ways and then list, listen to different bands that play it and uh, that's the cool part about music is is you know you you have the chance to reinvent the way that you teach and the way you listen to stuff all the time so that it's not the same thing and you know you can have a, a signature approach in a way you do stuff but maybe you know you want to mix that up a little bit and you want to try something different so I think being open to, you know, different rehearsal techniques, being open to different uh, ways that, that you might balance something or maybe different instrumentation or maybe, you, you know, people, do, you know, they tend to have composers that they really like to go to. Some people are, um, you know, are, talk with our, our middle school directors, they, they're big Robert Sheldon or Jan van der Roost and they play those in rotation all the time. And, uh, and I think that's great. I mean, I think they're great composers and, and you know, the, the, the middle school kids will turn over so often that you have the ability to go back to some of that stuff. Um, and maybe you're better when you teach it the second you know, or third time as you go through. But uh, you may find that by picking something, 
that maybe you're not as comfortable with or, or you're, you know, you don't, you don't think you like uh, that you might find that it's, it's a growth experience for you and for the group. So, you know, going out and observing when I, when I grew up in New Jersey, uh, we didn't have the luxury necessarily of going out and observing um, a lot of programs that, that were necessarily in line with, uh, I went to South Brunswick High School and, and taught there a lot and there were 250 kids in the band. Uh, we were one of the only programs in the state that had that. So, you know, teaching up there, it was sometimes hard to go out and, and, you know, here in Texas, if you take a 45 minute drive, a 30 minute drive, you can find another great group to go listen to for inspiration. And, uh, and that was a little bit of a challenge in, in, in a place where programs were smaller and people were competing for resources. And, and so, you know, it's, it's easy to say, you know, go, you know, go drive or go find somebody or, you know, but if you're the only program that's in your area, um, you know, it may require a little bit of traveling, getting on an airplane or getting, you know, getting in a, in a bus and taking a ride down somewhere. And, and, you know, even that may mix up your routine a little bit. So, you know, just understanding that there's an infinite number of ways to, to approach your rehearsals. And uh, at the point of where, you know, you feel like you may be stuck in a rut going out and studying someone else. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be somebody that uh, you know a lot about, you know, maybe it's, 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 you just do a little bit of research and, and ask if you can go observe, you're going to leave with the fresh sound in your ear. And, and maybe that gives you something different to work towards. And y'all are cooking tonight. Y'all are dropping the knowledge on us, <laughs> man. Hey, Mike, real quick, we're kind of going to shift gears just a little bit. Um, but as a head director, how do you encourage your staff, like your assistants that are on staff with you, uh, to share the same vision as you for the program and have the same teaching expectations of the kids? Well, the first way you get the staff to be on board with your basically creating a shared vision is A, to have a vision for your program that you can share with your staff. I think uh, you've got to know and got to have an idea of, you know, what do you want the experience for your kids, you know, what kind of experience do you want your kids to leave your program having? Um, what do you want the identity of your program to be within your school and your community? And I, I think it's huge of understanding what, what you're going to do to make the kids continue to love music after high school, um, which I think is one of the, the you know, one of the big charges of us as high school directors, we need to produce students that are lifelong lovers of music and that are going to, going to continue to support the arts once they leave. Um, I think, you know, John, a part of it honestly is in the hiring process and trying to develop a good team. But once you get past that, I think it all starts with everybody trying to get on the same page for what you want the student experience to be in the program. Um, and I know that's that's a big kind of that's a broad stroke when you get into that whole culture wor world or that whole culture word. Um, I do think it's important when you're when you're figuring out culture and you're figuring out vision in your band program that you know culture is much more than than social events and T-shirts and and all of the stuff because you got to think the way you define your culture is what you do with the majority of the time you spend with your kids. And 90% of the time you're, you're going to spend with your kids is in rehearsal. Uh, so the culture of your program is founded in your rehearsal setting, in my opinion, and your approach with those kids in that rehearsal setting. You know, all the ice skating parties or you know, section parties in the world can't replace how you, what you do with that bulk of time you spend with the kids in the rehearsal setting. Um, so making sure the directors are on the same page with how we – basically what kind of demand we're going to have for the kids, which is going to be high. Um, I want the staff to have very high expectations and I want our expectations to be aligned. I tell the students pretty often that they need to expect from every staff member that we are going to be very positively impatient at all times. Um, I want to continue to deposit, give, put deposits into the program in terms of keeping the kids lifted up. Um, but we want to do it with high expectations. I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer. And I, I think the other directors on here would, would say the same that you can have a very demanding program and a very positive program all at the same time. You know what I mean? That on the other coin with expectations, John, it's, you know, I ask my directors, I want you to always think, think this to yourself. 
are my kids looking forward to coming to my class? Like, are they looking forward to coming to band every day? And if not, why not? You know what I mean? Um, but having those constant conversations with the staff and trying to create a shared vision that's rooted in positive culture with extremely high expectations. It, I mean, that's, that's the vision right there. Uh, I do think, as I said before, that having a sense of program identity, you know, what do you want the perception of your program to be within the school and within the community? obviously within the band community too, but I think you got to start with uh, your main stakeholders, which is your school and your community. Um, and they need to understand that vision of positive culture and high expectations. They got to see it. They got to see it through how we serve the community. They got to see it through how we perform. And they got to see it more importantly through how our kids treat each other in the classroom. Yeah, man. <clears throat> It, 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 it's it's funny because a lot of this stuff, it's like, man, didn't Jared, say, didn't Robert, say, didn't Lisa say that? It's all connecting. It's all coming together here. It, it's, can, I tag, can I tag on to that? Please? Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that he's saying, but I don't think we've got what he said, and I, I can't speak for everybody else that's on here, but I can tell you the biggest thing that changes the culture is, is your approach. And... Um, I truly believe in the um, approach of being a um, servant leader. And if those kids see that I'm willing to do exactly what I'm asking of them, they jump on board way faster than me standing from my ivory tower, tower telling them what to do. Um, I, I have a horn in my hand almost every day willing to demonstrate what I need from them. Now, do I play every single instrument? No, but I can play a lot of them. And I've spent a lot of time learning them. And I do it like in my, my beginner classes. I will pick that instrument up and I will, I will work with him because I gotta know what it feels like to struggle or to know what it feels like to play that instrument. But, but the, the, the one thing I'm really proud of that we did at George Ranch High School was, uh, and, and when I was at Dulles Middle School too, um, Servant leadership was the foundation of who we were. And what I found is that when those kids buy into that servant leadership idea, they then begin serving each other. And it changes the environment. And the environment becomes extremely positive, uplifting, hopeful. Now, they're still high school kids, they're still junior high kids, and they're still gonna do silly things. But what I have found is that those kids begin to take up for each other, to edify each other, to when they see a wrong, they go try to help make it right. They clean up the band hall, they set up the chairs, they take ownership. And if you can, you can really establish servant leadership, and I don't care what level you are, if you can be in elementary school, if you model that daily, you will change how your program functions and you will, it, it will be, it will be very pleasant to come to work every day because they, they completely buy into what you're doing and they know that program belongs to them, that they're not just there. That's, that's something I'm extremely passionate about. So, um, but they, they, they all touched on it, but I just, the word servant leadership is. is <clears throat> I, I agree, Lisa, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing that will get more out of your students than student ownership over the program. It's just, it's such a huge thing. Yeah, we're, we're going to shift gears real quick. This is from uh, one of, from our chat. It says, I seem to go in circles in terms of long-term planning. Sometimes planning a whole year is a daunting blank canvas. Any tips for making it into manageable chunks? So any, anybody can jump in on this. So how, how do you approach it? <laughs> yeah. Planning? yeah. Uh, it is a daunting task. And sometimes you feel like you're playing darts with a blindfold on, you know what I mean? Um, I start with your calendar and, and start with each big event and then work backwards from each of those big events. You know what I mean? I think one, one thing that you'll notice about planning way far in advance, it almost becomes addictive. <laughs> you start to, 
you almost start to go too far. But I would look at your, you know, look at your calendar and divide it into pieces. You know, what are your big events that you're planning up towards? Set those in place. I think looking at it in terms of dates really helps me. And looking at it in terms of timelines really helps me. And I just work backwards. I start at the end and work backwards from one date to the previous big event, to the previous previous big event. I let those serve as, as yearly goals for the program moving from September through the end of May. And I'm like Mike, it's the exact same way. We plan backwards. I mean, we're actually starting calendar right now, believe it or not, um, for the upcoming year. I've been working on that a lot today. Um, but planning backwards and thinking about where you're going to go. And, you know, when I think middle school wise, um, it is very daunting, but um, in some ways, I think six weeks to six weeks sometimes in, in my middle school career, I mean, because every year that you have a new beginner class, it changes. And the, the flute class that you had last year may not be the flute class that you have this year. And so while you still have the same um, information that you want them to learn, the same skills, um, the way you're going to go about that is going to be different. So working the day to day and looking at what you have in front of you and what do you need to do with that group of kids to make it better as you continue to move forward. Um, and then of course, planning for, you know, ensembles is I always tell everybody to over plan, you know, over plan for everything. And that way you're always prepared and you never run out of material, but you always um, have something that you're working on. This question comes from the chat as well from Denzel Johnson. Uh, what are things to look for when choosing student leadership? So drum major, section leader, principal chairs, et cetera. Well, I think motivation and drive. And again, going back to what I said, somebody who looks like they have a heart for servant leadership. Those, those roles require somebody to, to sacrifice a lot. They're not easy roles to fill. And especially, you know, you're in a high school group and you have a band of, you know, 250, 300 kids or whatever. Um, it, it can be daunting to them. But if they take it as, as that servant leadership outlook, I'm telling you, kids will get behind them. But um, I've watched students that didn't have the servant leadership part and it didn't take very long before their, their, their sections turned on them uh, because they didn't like having somebody coming at them rather than working with them. So I, I, look, I look very much at how they interact and what is their motivation and, and how do they work. And I think, you know, build, building on that, um, the, the servant leadership thing has been huge for us. I'm, I'm happy you said it because we, you know, our drum majors, we always tell them we're looking for the people that are taking out the garbage. Uh, that's been our big thing is, is we, you know, we eat lunch during band camp and, and I'm always keeping an eye on, you know, whether it's a ninth, 10th grader, an 11th grader who's taking out the trash. Uh, and that's what our drum majors, that's, we, you know, rule number one for them. Uh, every meal that we have up at the school, they have to take out the trash after rehearsals. Uh, they have to coordinate the cleaning crew for the band hall. And so, you know, we talk a lot to them that, that you know, in their, their priority order in terms of their interests should be uh, cleaning up uh, and then you know do you have the time to help mentor and coordinate and they don't necessarily have to do it all themselves but they have to put the team together uh, that's going to set up for rehearsals and tear down and uh, and so you know we used to say that the conducting component for a drum major was the least in important and um, you know we've, we've kind of middled out on that just based on years of experience of okay there, it has to be important but it can't be the only thing uh, and it's got to be a student that you know if we, we ask the kids you know when when they uh, when the drum majors are kind of identified and their candidates are we, we send the names out to the kids and we ask them to vote and, and provide us feedback uh, and it's confidential and only we see it and we do it with Google but basically to get a perspective of do the kids view these as these students as as servant leaders as you know people uh, that they look up to and that they feel comfortable with and so uh, you know not every leader that we have is perfect we've run into situations where we've picked great kids and we've run into problems with drinking with kids and, and run into problems with kids being dishonest and being where they're not supposed to you know I think a lot of times you know we always imagine in, in programs that you know that kids can't possibly make mistakes uh, and some of our best leaders that were great at taking out the 
trash ended up making poor decisions. And so, you know, I think the, the biggest piece for us is that we, we try to look for kids that uh, do the best they can to, um, you know, to walk the, the talk and, and do what they say they're going to do. Uh, and we want to know that they're treating the other students with a, with a lot of respect and, and that they're great uh, and that they're really willing to put in the time uh, on the the tasks that aren't it's not great to be cleaning up garbage and cleaning up socks and picking up you know other people's uh, junk at, at the end of a, of a rehearsal and uh, they're willing to do that that's uh, that's that's good enough for us yeah again we're gonna we're gonna switch switch another gear and another question Jaden Bernal asked and this is for everybody because it's, it's kind of a combo question how do you keep continuity and familiarity between feeder middle schools and high school band programs? How are the directors interacting at both schools? I think it's, it's like any good relationship. It just takes effort. It's not going to happen on its own. Um, it is not, there's nothing convenient about finding time to, for the middle schools to be with the high schools and for the high schools to be with the middle schools. You have, it takes effort. Um, so making sure that you find time, one, for those groups to know each other, the, just the directors to know each other, and then just to be on each other's campuses. Um, I have found that there's, there's no better recruitment for middle schools going to high school than the high school, middle school students just knowing who the high school band directors are. Exactly. Um, yeah. All the t-shirts and middle school nights in the world, none of that replaces um, presence on the campus. And you know, it's it's interesting. I've had I've had years. We have two middle schools at Feed Vandegrift. Um, one's right next door, and the other one is is a, probably about a ten minute drive. Um, it's interesting. We because we had lost a middle school band director. Uh, I was spending a lot of time at Canyon Ridge, one of our middle schools, and not as much near as much time as four at Four Points Middle School, even though it was right next door. Um, just because we were trying to fill a void. And I was actually over there teaching beginner percussion classes uh, at Canyon Ridge. And it was interesting to see the, the fluctuation in recruitment. Our, we actually got a little bump um, from our Canyon Ridge numbers. Four points stayed about the same. Canyon Ridge bumped up. And it, there's nothing special that happened. All that happened was just just being there and for the kids when you're walking down the hall at the middle school to be able to say hey mr howard how's, how's it going but i can tell you there's you know i know for me and i think the other guys would would echo it just it it takes effort you know the the day the day is busy you know i like to call it seems like uh headband directing at a high school and i'm sure middle school feels like i'm juggling chainsaws at time you know what i mean there's just a lot going on um, so to be able to press stop and pause and make sure that you have a presence over at the middle school campus, even though, you know, it's easier said than done, I think is a huge part of it. Yeah, well, I do think uh, it has to be purposeful in the fact that, you know, we, I, I actually continue, while I was at George Ranch High School, I continued to teach um, beginners. Um, I didn't want to give it up because I, I, I love it. I, I, that's, that, that decides your program right there. If the beginners aren't taught well, then there's going to be problems all the way through high school. Um, and so um, we were a team in the fact that we um, we split up and I was over there on in some years. I was over there twice a day. I would run over there. It was next door, but or a little ways down. I still it was very purposeful to be able to get over there and get back. So I think you have to figure out if you have the staff and the time to be able to get yourselves on the campus. And if so, to um, commit to it. Sometimes the, the, I know the, the bell schedules conflict, especially at high school, because at any given moment, I know for us, pep rallies or other events that are occurring or whatever would sometimes interfere with that. But I know we tried really hard to, to, to make sure somebody was on that campus teaching that class from the high school um, when we had those uh, things happen. Well, and I think that for, um, the purposes of, you know, I only teach middle school and I've only taught middle school, but I will tell you just from my experience, Mike said it the best. First of all, for the 
the staff, you have to find time and you have to make time. And that's one of the things that we've really done a good job of between my middle school and high school feeders. And there are two, like I'm a direct feeder. The other one, the other middle school is a, a partial feeder, you know? And so between that staff and our staff and the high school staff, really making time to um, get to know each other outside of teaching has really helped the relationship between, you know, the middle school and the high school. I will tell you though, that middle school kids know that love their middle school band directors and we are what they know and we're the most constant they change math teachers every year that they're in middle school but the band director stays the same so when they leave middle school and they go to high school they need to know that and see that familiar face and if that or they won't sign up you know it's that they're so afraid of leaving the middle school and going into they're all afraid of marching band you know everybody they, they, they can't do it they don't think they'll ever be able to march and you know so having that presence over and, and we have done a really good job in our cluster of just having presence in every class they don't always make it over for beginners but they are always there there's someone there in all three of the seventh and eighth grade performing bands all once a week and i think that is monumental and we send them out and when you're there like don't just when band, when high school directors are on the campus get involved in the in the ensembles don't just stand on the side and text on your telephone you know and let's be real that's what some of them are doing you know but instead get out there and go stand behind the trombones or go stand behind the trumpets and help out and i'm really good at like stopping and saying hey mr atkinson what did you hear do you have anything that you want to add and i think when the students hear those teachers talking and us collaborating together it helps the continuity between the two schools a lot and of course using the same verbiage and i know that we are very good in leander isd about making sure that we're aligned vertically and i think that is super important so that when the kids leave the middle school and they go to the high school they're hearing the same terminology and the same verbiage and they're not feeling like they're having to relearn information to feel like they can be a part of the team there and and i can tell you being at state marching contest you know and seeing Robert Herring's down on the field cheering on the students that he taught when he was in middle school, that he stays with them all the way through. And, and I'm in a cluster where our middle school director, Bernard, uh, is at all of our high school marching rehearsals. And uh, his, we have a husband and wife team where, where one is at one feeder and one is at the other. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm down there with them as much as possible. And, and, you know, we try to talk so much about band being a six through 12 experience. And, you know, that can be a lot harder if you're one director at the high school and one at the middle school. It's like, how do you coordinate getting down there and how do you make that work? And I, I mean, I can only imagine that I would be trying to think out of the box where whether maybe I traded with my middle school director uh, or I brought in a sub. And even if it was once a month, I went down on my middle school. But I think the, the importance of the relationship between the high school and the middle school, you know, all of us have said the same thing. It's, it's so important. And, you know, if you're in Texas and, and you know, you, you're, you need to be at your middle school UILs that's not an option I mean that's that's you need to be there and um, and understand that the middle school guys may not be able to reciprocate that because they do teach in a structured schedule from the beginning of the day until the end and usually the high school schedules offer a little bit of flexibility because of the way that stuff is done with staffing so I just uh, you know I, I a lot of times people will say you know I, I don't get along with the middle school directors or you know I, I go down and then they don't put me to work or and I just I, I it's like we've all said the same thing you have to figure out how to make that relationship work and the first couple years with Johnson and, and to hit at Bernard and I really didn't see eye to eye and, and what solved it was we went out for beers together around the third year and we just said why isn't this working why aren't we getting along and you know we both had to be willing to put our egos aside and, and talk about what we could do to be better and um, and, and I think the, the, the biggest piece is it's like you know for high school guys those kids are coming to you you know that's your future and so it serves you no matter what to be invested in that or from the very first day that they start uh, and the more that you can make the middle school guys feel like they're a part of it it's it's pretty rewarding when uh, like I said I mean it's like you see Robert watching his trumpet soloist his trombone soloist they're winning the state marching contest and you know he knows a lot of these kids are sitting in his band and you know we you know that's it's really cool when you get to have that experience so you know try to try to make that happen if that's not been a priority for you and this next question, we kind of were talking about this before we let everybody in from the waiting room. Uh, but Jared, I, I actually want you to start um, on the answering side of this. But how do you approach uh, virtual learning with your ensemble? Uh, and what are some of your goals for the remainder of the school year? How will you approach next school year? 
I think when we, we started doing the, the virtual learning, you know, our, our biggest goal was is just to keep contact with the kids and to keep them positive uh, and, and to make sure that they were okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. I mean, that was a genuine, you know, it, uh, if we got nothing else done other than we were seeing them, whether it was once a week uh, or every day, and just being able to have that contact was something that was familiar. You know, we, we tried immediately to set out on a routine and we were very fortunate that our district was supportive of us creating a routine team um, where we see some of the top kids every day and so since you know spring break uh, we have seen the the top wind ensemble kids every day for 45 minutes to an hour uh, and then for some of the kids that uh, are in in the lower bands we might do once a week to try to reduce the commitment and we invite them to the rehearsals that meet every day so some of them that may want to come they're open uh, but we try not to, to obligate it uh, we spent time trying to find the kids that maybe didn't have access to technology uh, and and we were able to Fortunate again, and this is this is fortunate for the for the community. It's it's an upper middle class community, um, you know, that we were able to line them up with technology stuff. Uh, but I've watched other programs in our district that are not upper middle class, that are lower socio, uh, that have been able to figure out ways to do it too. You know, whether it's that they're you know they're they're tar targeting their kids and going over to the house and you know lining them up with an iPad or an iBook, or you know if you kind of just focus in on your program and what you can control, uh, you, you probably can be pretty creative with it. So just a structure of the week for us, we probably spend, you know, two to three days a week going through daily drill stuff, doing master classes on techniques for getting better at the instruments, you know, just like you would do a beginner class, you know, you plan exercise and one kid plays while the rest of them are on mute. Uh, and then with the other, the other days of the week, we're doing a lot of stuff that, uh, that each of us did in our oral skills class in college fundamentals or ear training, uh, a lot of solfege, a lot of pitch matching where we'll be in a key and we'll push a note down and have the kids sing it back uh, and and you know we had done a lot of singing in our fundamentals as it was so they were kind of set up to be able to do that uh, but I mean I think you know there's really basic things that you can do you know to get kids to, to do singing and uh, one of my college professors posted a video from Rutgers of, of, of them doing their ear training stuff and and all stuff that we could be doing with our bands and with whether it's middle school or high school uh, that I don't think is a waste of time so uh, we're doing a, a solo recital at the end of April where the kids will give a you know a three to five minute little performance and if they didn't have a lesson teacher we gave them music that they could pick and, and tried to have stuff that was not stressful or that and so uh, you know our goal going into next year was just that that we did something this spring uh, that um, was helpful you know to their skills and and it wasn't so much about uh, necessarily having to look back at the end and go, we know we got better, but just to try some things that we think might keep them engaged and, and make them better in the process. And um, I, I know someone just asked, and, and maybe Robert can do this with singing. Someone asked about middle school students with the singing. I know that we, we brought in our middle school choir director to kind of help with that, uh, with the vocal ranges and kind of helping the boys navigate that. But um, I don't know, um, you know, Robert, where, where you're at with, with that kind of stuff too. On, on what somebody might do who does. Well, we sing uh, starting in sixth grade. Like they start singing right from the beginning before we even actually start playing their instruments, they're actually singing. And the, you know, we, we teach our kids that number one, um, we're not trying to be a choir. I know you didn't sign up for choir, but the reason that we do this is because it's gonna make you a better musician. And there's nothing wrong with singing, there's nothing wrong with being a choir. And we also talk about not laughing at each other. And we celebrate the, the joke in my band hall is that I, I'm the only one that can laugh at people. No one else can laugh at anyone. And so we, uh, I'll get out there and we just help them navigate. And I tell them, you sing where your voice is. We don't, we don't really worry about it until they get in seventh and eighth grade. And then when they get in seventh and eighth grade, we do a, a ton of singing in seventh and eighth grade and singing chorales and singing parts. And I do bring our choir directors over and they talk about vocal technique and we help our students learn. But when they're in sixth grade and it's just the beginning and they're just learning how to like play an instrument, I just want them to be comfortable in the band hall and comfortable making mistakes and comfortable being who they are. Um, but we want them singing because it really does help. And even when you're like, trying to extend range like on brass instruments it's really great when they're singing you know because they hear it and then they understand how it fits in and then they can emulate that with your instruction on what they need to do um, on their instruments to continue to get better so yes we sing a lot in middle school and and this is a great time to be working on that because it's something that they can do at home and so that's why you know, I went back to the to this to the ear training and the solfege and the pitch matching. So we're doing some dictation stuff, uh, you know, and then try to transfer it over to the instruments. There's and Jared, you had mentioned something about this, and there's a few questions about this, but 
and this is this is a big question. There's there can be a lot of answers, but w- what do you do in your daily drill? What does your daily drill look like? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, th- I think um, for for us, our our daily drill, we always say uh, some kind of long tone for brass, some kind of lip slur, and some kind of tonguing exercise. And and I don't really care what it is that you know for for the woodwind players. I have woodwind teachers that love register slurs and harmonic slurs, and ones that don't think they have any value. And so you know sometimes we have the woodwinds do technique when we're doing slurs. But I just feel like you know if you can if you map out your kids' daily routine. Uh, with some kind of breathing, some singing, and then you do your, you know, a long tone, whether it's an F descending, a B flat concert scale, a Remington exercise. I, I don't think that that's as important as it's something that they use to develop, you know, endurance and beautiful sound, the flexibility for the brass players, uh, and then a way to learn how to tongue. Uh, and, and I think that those are things that you, if you kind of just start with that as a rough basis, you can come up with an infinite number of different things for your daily drill. Mm-hmm. Right on. Folks, uh, we're almost out of time once again. Uh, we're going to ask one more question. Uh, but before you guys go, there's two things I want you to know. One, uh, I'm going to compile a lot of the, the questions that we didn't get to, specifically the middle school ones, and I'm going to get with um, a couple of our panelists, and we're going to try to get those answered. Robert and I kind of communicated on that one. Um, and so if you have questions, continue to drop them. We're going to find some way to, to, to post Uh, the questions and the answers if we get them uh, so you guys can get that information. Secondly, uh, I'm going to post a link in the chat right now and same thing on Facebook. I'm going to post something in the comment section for you. Uh, This is a a feedback form on the the conference this week. Go ahead and fill that out. It's super short. It's like 10 questions. It'll take you less than five minutes to fill it out. Um, But I do want your feedback on what was good. What can we do better? Uh, because ultimately, like nobody's monetarily profiting from this. We're just getting smarter and we're getting better at our crafts. And ultimately, I would like for there to be more information for people to for people to access. So fill out that form um, and, and and get going from there. Okay. Um, last question. Um, there we go. Um, we. I'm sorry. I got lost. Uh, all right. How do you keep the kids in second or third band motivated? Is that middle school, high school, or just in general? It's just general. There's no specification. Um, you know, I'll speak on behalf of, you know, middle school wise for what we do anyways. Um, I think the presence of the head band director and all of the non-varsity and the sub non-varsity rehearsals is the biggest thing that I have found to be the, our biggest motivator. And I am one of those that will be the biggest cheerleader out there. And I will, um, you know, do a cartwheel if I need to, to celebrate those kids, you know, in those rehearsals. And I never talk about the top band. If we're going to TMEA or Midwest or Seattle or whatever we're doing, we don't, we never mention that or talk about that in the non-varsity bands, but we always celebrate what those kids are doing in their class and what level they're at. And we celebrate when they're, when they're successful on things. Um, You know, the other thing that's really great is all of our kids are paired up um, with, um, a mentor kind of thing in sixth grade. So your eight, your upper kids are paired with someone. So there's that friendship that kind of is built in the culture there so that all of our kids love and support each other. And we tell our students, you know, especially in my top band, the goal of the top band kids is to raise up our sub non-varsity and non-varsity kids. You are the ones that should get out there and be singing their praises. And whenever, whenever there is anything that is great that goes on in those classes, I make sure to tell my ensemble about it so that the top band is able to see those kids in the hallway and, and really say, hey man, Mr. Hang said that you were great. And sometimes I'll say things like, and lit, it's, sometimes it's true, like they'll play a concert F better than my band did that day. And I'll tell them that and say, listen, you guys played your concert F better than the honors band played concert F today, so congratulations. And they sit up a little bit taller. But but I think the biggest thing really is just being present. You know, the head directors being present in those rehearsals so that those kids don't feel like they're less than. They feel like they're just as important as any other group that's on that campus. And I, and I think they want to know that, that you have just as high expectations for them as you do um, the other band, the upper band. And um, being present and, and demanding yet cheerleaders of what they're doing, I think is extremely important. They don't, if they ever feel like they're not, they're not really being challenged, then they won't take the, uh, the class seriously. I think, 
I completely agree. And I, something I'm really passionate about with our program is that every kid gets to participate in the same things, meaning um, I don't care if the fourth band has eight kids or 48 kids, they're going to contest. Every kid's going to contest because I think it causes, helps us as teachers. If we know every band's going to UIL, then we all teach them to meet the standard. Um, and as Robert's saying, the goal, one of the expectations of a wind ensemble member at our school is to constantly check in with and motivate and lift up the students in the lower bands. Always the expectation that, so if we're, you know, if we're at a, uh, if there's a performance or something, if the, if the, if concert band two is going to UIL, typically our principal will allow me to get our at least a chunk of our wind ensemble kids out of school to go support them at that performance because some of sometimes that performance might be a little earlier and may not be as well attended and that's that's why i tell the principal say look if we don't get a bunch of kids there those kids aren't going to have an audience at uil we need to get them there but just things that you can do that create a culture with the students and with the directors that kind of the bread and butter of your program is what's happening in those in those lower bands i mean that's that's the future of the program All hearts and minds clear? All right. Well, folks, let's give a huge hand to all of our clinicians. They did a fabulous job. So much knowledge coming down tonight. I know I already have a page and a half full of notes. I'm ready to go analyze, break it down. How can I put it in my program? Uh, I, I want to thank all the clinicians again. This entire week, we really had world-class uh, folks coming in and, and presenting to us. Uh, clinicians, and this is only if you want to, and I'm sorry because we did, I didn't prep you for this. If you would like to drop your email for people to ask you questions, you could put it in the chat. You please don't feel pressure to, but if you'd like to, you can drop your emails in the chat. I um, think it's disabled, maybe. Uh, let me see. Should be good. My fault. I do want to tell you, John, I didn't, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I, I really appreciate the invitation to do this. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to not only be a part of it, but, but, but the rest of the week. It's been fantastic, and um, what a blessing um, it is to have you so motivated to, to bring everybody together. So thank you very much, and thank you to everybody else that was here. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great, folks. This entire week, every single person that I asked, nobody said no. It was absolutely, how can I help? And, and it, it's <laughs> the heart of the people that we're working with and that are in our band community are absolutely incredible. So again, thank you to you all that are here, to all the clinicians this week. I, I really want to say a huge thank you to you guys. Uh, fill out that feedback form. Uh, it should be in the chat for you. That'll help um, if, if this does continue or anything like that. It'll help give me insight as to how to do that. Uh, so thank you again. Clinicians, if you'll stay on for just a couple minutes, we'll uh, do a quick little pow. Everybody else, have a wonderful rest of your, your school year. Sad face. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Have a great night.